record. There we go. That is, and then we've got our share screen and Okay. Could I have confirmation from anyone, everyone that you see the first image? Yep. See Fabulous. It. All right. We'll get started. Everyone's ready to roll. Fantastic. Okay, so my name is Kara Judea Al Khadef, and today's presentation with the big bold Jewish Climate Fest. I'm delighted you're all here. And thank you to the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest. My presentation is Indigenous Wisdoms, Reclaimed Actions, Love Lessons from Zazu Dreams. And the images you will see are by Michaela Amato Amato, who did the paintings for the book we will be discussing uh, on environmental racism and cultural refugees. Um, and the Ladino, you will hear, is their Ladino Proverbs, uh, recorded by Daisy Saragosi. So thank you to both Daisy and Micaela. And we will begin with Zazu. We pray to revered, to our revered Zadik for an end to profit-driven biocide. We prayed for an end to the monoculture of the mind. We prayed for ecological intelligence to help us figure out how to act together. No, how to encourage people to realize the deep connections between environmental ju justice and human rights and act together to stop the suffering of people whose lands and waters, water are poisoned and stolen. We prayed for a transition from a global extraction economy to a global regenerative economy. I realized that a search for home was at the root of all these prayers. Home, I now understood, was lived and shared, opening to global in interconnectedness. We can stop these crimes against nature if we can understand the relationship between Bal Tashit and a collective Tikkun alone, between caring for people and caring for our environment for what Mama calls our indigenous social ecology. Thank you, Zazu. So goes my cross-cultural tale of Jewish polymaths and conviviality, biophilia and multiplicity. In the tradition of the Magid, I offer this tapestry as a strategy to ignite social justice dialogue, ecological consciousness, and collective action. Throughout this presentation, you will hear Ladino, the language of my family, a hybrid of ancient Spanish, Hebrew, Arabic, Turkish, Italian, French, and Greek, and many other languages, depending on where the Mizrahi and Sephardi Jews had fled when they were exiled from Iberia and Europe during the various expulsions beginning in the 14th century. Those who take risks accomplish the most. Both the multiplicity of ethnic identities and the Jewish diaspora and principles found in Jewish languages, symbols, festivals, literature, life cycle markers and discussions of Torah can be antidotes to our industrial waste consumer culture. I contend that the alternative to convenience culture is not inconvenience. Consumer reduction, quote unquote, has been an unpopular approach to environmental crises because it falsely implies sacrifice. I suggest we redefine convenience and taken for granted normative infrastructures. The ethnic mosaic of Jewish identities is integral to understanding how we can engage on a day-to-day -day basis with the sacred world around us, while encouraging individuals and communities to collectively resist industrialized capitalism and its inherent self-destructive consequences. This presentation offers behavioral and infrastructural design shifts that embody Jewish sacred activism. Una mano lava la otra, 
y las dos lavan la cara. One hand washes the other, and together they wash the face. I ask, how can we transform habitual behaviors of entitlement and obsessive accumulation so that we can embody the ways we are all interconnected as a model and resource for compassionate living? How can citizen activists manifest symbiotic solutions as we transition from our anthropogenic petroleum pharmaceutical addicted cyber culture to a biocentric commons, one that inspires, educates, and mobilizes people of diverse backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, as well as economic and otherwise. How can we hold accountable ourselves and corporations while recalibrating our normalized relationship to consumption, disposal habits that we know harm us and our children, as well as everyone around the world? Caen a la mar se cae, de la espanda se detiene. A drowning man will hang on to anything. Again, these are all Ladino proverbs. Navigating our own extinction along with the collapse of the known world, we witnessed, we witnessed not only our fears and failures, but also the exhilarating potential to radically transform, which is why I'm here, our anthropogenic status quo that defines our species hubris. Transitioning from the Anthropocene era, and one way of defining that would be human-induced ecological destruction due to advanced capitalism, rampant consumerism, international development, environmental racism, and transitioning to biophilia, love of life. This, ne this necess necessitates collaborative personal political practices echoing Judaic exegetical dialogue rooted in mindfulness and deep inquiry. This transition depends on the nur nurturing the sacred in everyday objects, as well as the ecologies they inhabit. Counter, this practice of interdependency cultivates Mam Mamonides holism the intersection of biodiversity and biophilia. Rabbi Seidenberg reminds us, quote, Maimonides who integrated medieval philosophy and Judaism, Oop, I just lost my text. Okay, we're with Maimonides. Let's meditate on him for just a moment until I recover through technology where I was. Is it this one? Everyone should mute themselves. Yeah, I do hear um, little buzzing sounds. Or, or birds. Let's hope they're birds. But um, in any case, people could, could mute themselves. So we're with Nabonides and Rabbi Seidenberg. Are people able to mute themselves? All right. As when we meditate, we bring in everything that is, in around, that is around us. And rather than trying to block out, we bring it in and process it and then continue. So with Rabbi Seidenberg, he reminds us, Maimonides, who integrated medieval philosophy and Judaism, warned, ag warned against seeing everything in anthropocentric terms, suggesting instead that we think of the whole creation and each creature in terms of its of itself instead of in terms of its usefulness to us." End quote. Seidenberg describes the imperative of co-evolution. Quote, we need to grow up in relation to the earth, to enter into mutual relationships, to cherish kinship with all life rather than reward exploitation. And pardon my Hebrew, shaluchach haken, the Hebrew term for kindness or compassion toward non-human animals is one commandment that offers a window into our souls and a yardstick of measure to measure how far we have come along that path. Counter to agribusiness and advanced capitalism, Jewish sacred activism incorporates a commitment to our non-human kin. These include Shabbat, the Jewish laws of Shemitah, 
again, pardon my pronunciation, and the sabbatical years, including Yovel, the Jubilee years. Judaic relationships to generosity and agriculture, gleaning, eco-crash root, restoring balance to the land, forgiving debt, and multiple interpretations of fertility offer visions of possibility for contemporary social and environmental justice. In contrast to tyrannies of linear progress, these biophilic relationships reflect the necessity for cross-cultural connection and communications. For example, plant time honors the difference between human time and vegetal temporalities, the cycles of germination, growth, maintenance, seeding, and dormant dormancy or death. By understanding the interconnections between homogenized cultures, impoverished soils, and resulting malnutrition, we can collaboratively create more efficient and just alternatives to the Anthropocene in our daily lives. We can generate a fertile territory within the intersections between ethnic identities, indigenous wisdoms, and our natural environment as a basis for global justice. Jewish philosophies resonate with this enfoldment of material, spiritual, and social bodies. A donde comen dos, comen y tres. Where two people eat, three people also can. Spiritual intelligence embraces practicing teachings from the Zohar, the foundation of Kabbalistic thought, how to lead a practical holy life. Like the Zohar, the Islamic Arabic concept of Adab, and the Yamas and Niyamas of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras in the Hindu tradition also offer both individual and social behavioral ideals for which to strive to live an ethical life. The word yoga translates as to yoke, to unite. Examining Kabbalah from a feminist perspective, as does Rabbi Tirza Firestone, we witness, she reminds us, all things, how all things exist in a state of inherent yehud, a uniting of disparate parts. And Judaism is rooted in this equilibrium in flux. Similarly, Kabbalah scholar Daniel Matt explains that the Zohar crosses binaries, interweaves our differences, Beria, Yetz, Yetzira, and Asiya, the aggregation of the three faculties of thought, speech, and action form mazolot, mazolot constellations. He tells us, to those without spiritual attainment, the Zohar reads like a collection of allegories and legends that can be interpreted and perceived differently by each individual. But to those with spiritual attainment, i.e. Kabbalists, the Zohar is a practical guide to interactions that one performs in order to discover deeper, higher states of perception and sensation. Practicing, another little technical glitch here. Practicing the yamas and niyamas parallel Jews' commitment to read the Bible, the Talmud Midrash, exegetically through a contemporary context magnifying glass, learning about how to live in the now. In the story of the Jews, Simon, Shama's, Simon Shama defines Judaism as living in the here and now. He explores the Mishnah as a text which presents, quote, how to be and stay Jewish in a non-Jewish world. Through repetition, oral interpretation, and laws of daily life. Like the Yamas and Niyamas, the synagogue's mosaic floor in the ancient Israeli village of Sephoris, a major cultural crossroads, depicts life itself as a place of worship. Abraham Joshua Heschel declared, our goal should be to live life in radical amazement. Get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. Never treat life casually. To be spiritual is to be amazed. Rabbi Tears of Firestone, who I mentioned before, explores this deep mindfulness as a shared purpose in which we are brought together to grow beyond ourselves. In order to be fed, we must feed the world around us 
or our system collapses, end quote. We can cultivate traditional indigenous practices, the spiritual intelligence as a form to ecological living. And one personal example of living Jewish ecological thought is how my family and I build our home, how we animate the embodied energy of each object and the space we create by combining them, which is where we are now. This is a deliberate commitment to local and global nonviolence. When we consider the objects and the space, the place that they shared sacred, that they share sacred, nothing is taken for granted. We embody radical amazement, infusing awe through our daily interactions. Animating our embodied energy allows us to shift our relationship to consumer waste culture's everyday violence, creating a bridge between infrastructural change and individual collective accountability. I am happy to be in dialogue with others about this intimacy that deeply shifts our relationship to objects and people as disposable. For the past three years, my family and I have lived in a biocentric art installation. Using only repurposed materials and equipment, we converted a school bus into our performance-based tiny home. Our live love bus is a spiritual commitment, a Kabbalistic practice. Rabbi Firestone shares, quote, never actually occurring in the Bible, the term Shekinah is the, and the concept of God dwelling here and now, the very essence of the feminine presence is hinted at when God tells Moses, let them, the people, make, me, make for me a sanctuary so that I may dwell within them. And the dwell, again, my Hebrew, uh, maybe someone at the end who speaks Hebrew can, can say this word in a lovely way. Uh, so I can, I'll share that later. Um, and this, this idea is rooted in the ancient Hebraic philosophy of gugulim, to reanimate or reincarnate, a process of bringing new life to that which was considered dead or landfill. Trash, the big quotes around it, an object no longer valued, no thus deemed as waste, is rooted in Western concepts of development and progress. When we rethink taken for granted assumptions that perpetuate the fact that over 40% of the content of American landfills is construction waste, we can shift the underlying concept of development from neocolonialism to, as Paul Hawken urges, reimagine development as a tool for restoring nature and communities. In contrast, continual renewal implied in Gu Gulim echoes the first law of thermodynamics, the total amount of energy can never be altered. Energy can never be created nor destroyed. Instead, it is transformed. Learning from cross-cultural wisdoms, indigenous wisdoms, we choose to embody this law in how we live our home. Lo que se aprende en la cuna, cien años dura. What you learn in the cradle lasts a hundred years. When we are clearly attuned with the space and objects around us, we witness what is already here, how it can be used in surprising ways. Like the physicist and cosmologist Stephen Hawking's idea, everything we need to know is already within us, just waiting to be realized. Leah Sharabi, the Mizrahi mystic, declared, quote, everything you see has a spark of holiness in it that is waiting to rise up. It wants to be free like a person in prison who longs to be rescued. Rescuing an everyday object means that we release its inherent dignity. Although not directly identifying with animism, Hinduism, or even Kabbalah, Sharabi believed that everything has a soul. Every object is sacred. The most menial tasks are sacred. When we embrace the sacred possibilities of mutual accountability, we can begin to uproot our materialist society, eventually rebuilding in its place a living democracy. It's Francis Moore LaPay's phrase, that, that which aligns our values with a natural world. In answer to this question, how can we live our ecological Jewish thought as an ever evolving practice that invigorates our most vital relationships? I wrote Zazu Dreams Between the Scarab and the Dung Beetle a cautionary fable for the Anthropocene era. This quintessential Judaic Agadah, 
explores ecological extinction in the context of cultural extinction, including histories of forced conversion rooted in binary driven fundamentalism that undergirds our oppression of silence and assimilation. Zazu Dreams is a call for hospitality and a renewed convivencia, conviv conviviality referring to the golden age of Spain during which Muslim and Jewish literature, science and arts flourished. Convivencia can be framed as the apothesis of non-binary relationships. Historian Americo Castro has said that Spain must acknowledge that Hispanics are historically one half Muslim, one half Jewish and one half Catholic. Understanding historical relationships between the Spanish Inquisition and contemporary manifestations of erasing cultural difference and ecosystem diversity, Zazu, the protagonist shares, I understood more and more that there was so much work to be done that the only way to heal ethnic and racial divisions and the ecology of our global body is to see how we are all intermeshed. We all have to take care of each other." End quote. The characters become increasingly aware of ecological relationships throughout the Middle East, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. Symbiosis between humans and nature has been the norm. Along the way, they learn from historic figures such as Spinoza, in the middle here, uh, Rachel Carson, Harriet Tubman, Donia Gracia Nazi, Sol Hachuel, Iniat Nur Khan, and Ibn Sina, as well as 21st century villains like Nestle, Merck, Exxon, and Monsanto. Big oil, big pharma, and agribusiness giants that stock planet Earth. Zazu Dreams crosses the border between diasporic identities with environmental action. Todo que tiene hambre, venga y comen. Let anyone who is hungry come and eat with us. I just want to make sure people can hear the Ladino proverbs. Thumbs up if you can. Yes, wonderful. Zazu Dreams is divided into two sections, image and narrative, as well as about 400 endnotes of scientific, economic, historical, and literary references. All the human characters in the story are real historical figures. In his dreams, Zazu, a Sephardic boy, travels the globe on a humpback whale, crossing both temporal dimensions and international borders, overlapping vast time and space. Following the Kabbalistic idea that Quote, water has the power of purifying because it takes you to a place of interconnection, transforming a person of separateness to a person of interconnectedness. The characters travel across the world's oceans and seas. And in today's performance, my collaborator who will join me, will read ex um, excerpts from the magical realist narrative. And I will read the voice of the compendium deriving from Walter Benjamin's Arcades project. This is a story of unlearning what we think we know and learning love along the way. It is an invitation to practice Kabbalah in our daily lives. Time to begin. Con pedos no se bullatea huevos. And this excerpt, oh, I, I can't forget this one. Um, one cannot paint eggs with farts which one translation is, change requires action. This excerpt highlights the relationship between resisting cultural extinction, in this case of Sephardic Jews from the Iberian Peninsula and ecological extinction, and in this case, coral reefs. This comes from chapter two, the pirates of the Caribbean. What a great adventure we had, Ari. All the stories my family has told me have come to life in my halons, my dreams. Last night I dreamt about the Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Many Jews became pirates, outlaws, and freedom fighters because hundreds of thousands of Jews were brutally forced by the Inquisition to flee Spain and Portugal, convert to Christianity, or be killed. 
similar to the Salem witch trials of the late 1600s in Massachusetts, between the years 1100 and 1800, hundreds of thousands of Jews were charged with witchcraft and conjuring magic spells. Thousands were publicly executed. Many conversos, new Christians, practiced Judaism in secrecy. People who had converted to Christianity were called anusim, forced ones, muranos, swine, chuetas, pig eaters. All were officially sanctioned vilifying names. The Inquisition of 1492 coincided with the conquistadors' invasion of the Americas. It behooves present day environmental activists who are fighting against colonial oppression to recognize the intermeshed histories between the expulsions of the Jews and the original occupation of the Americas. Jewish people had lived in Spain for more than 1,000 years before we were violently expelled from our ancient homeland. In my dream, when we first met Rabbi Habibi from Gibraltar, he had recited ancient Ladino poetry, heavy with the melancholy of our diaspora. I remember his deep hypnotic voice chanting. Montañas lloran por aire. Mountains cry for air. Hablar quiero y no puedo. Mi corazón suspira. I want to speak. I can't. My heart sighs. Cuando sale la luna, nadie come naranjas. When the moon departs, no one eats oranges. Sharing this same sadness and loss during the Inquisition, Swashbuckling Ladino-speaking pirates ransacked the, mon the monarchy's flotilla on the high seas across the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. Rebellious Sephardic pirates got their revenge against the Spanish galleons. The Sephardim were not pirates like today's Somali pirates and, and others. They were privateers licensed by Spain's enemies. In retaliation for Jews and Moors being expelled from Spain, Sephardic pirates looted gold from King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella's Armada. The Sephardi pirates also prevented Catholic missionaries from landing on shore and converting indigenous peoples to Christianity. Mama told me this history is an important part of the age of colonialism, but we are not taught any of this history in school. Understanding how and why our histories have been forgotten or ignored might help us understand how and why animals and their environments are being destroyed. For example, coral reefs represent the perfect metaphor for symbiosis of convivencia, co-beneficial interdependency. Coral reefs are the result of millions of years of teamwork between coral and algae coexisting across multiple life cycles as they share food and shelter. Every organism, structure, and raw material fulfills a job that benefits the entire community. Coral reef ecosystems are the carbonate landscape that govern ocean communities. They are the rainforests of the ocean. There is almost no waste on a coral reef. And the whole idea of waste is at the, at the core of this discussion. Warmer sea temperatures due to climate crisis disrupt the delicate symbiotic relationships among coral organisms, sea slugs, and algae. All coral reef species throughout the Caribbean are severely threatened. Coral reefs are now identified as the graveyard of the Atlantic. We continued our expedition across the turquoise waters of the Caribbean Sea. The smell of salt water and the screeching cry of seagulls always overhead. Once again, I felt we were sliding through time as we traveled across the sea. Time appeared to be suspended between the past and the future in a continuous present. We seemed to be inside folded time, overlapping prehistory and the Middle Ages all the way up to 2016. We held on tightly to our whale through the Panama Canal to the vast Pacific Ocean. 
exhausted and parched by the heat of the sun, we approached the subcontinent of India in the Arabian Sea. After thousands of kilometers of listening to the songs of the whales, I began to decipher their collective voice as a song of peace. As communal animals, whales instinctively know we are all interconnected. We are all interdependent. All creatures of the land, of the oceans, rivers, lakes, and skies. El mundo se manea, mano cae. The world shakes, but does not crumble. This next excerpt emphasizes the power of language, both emancipatory language, in this case, Ladino's dynamic nature, and manipulative language, in this case, mass misinformation about alternative energies. This comes from chapter five, it takes a village. But beware, we cannot assume that what we see is what there is. Some people think Ladino is a fossilized language, like this beetle preserved in an amber deposit, forever under unchanging. But Ladino is alive. It is like this shofar, reminding us of our interconnectedness. Our relationship to this ram's horn is our humility, our breath. The interaction between human and divine, our coexistence brings us beauty and joy, like the bending and adapted, adaptability, adaptability of a reed, the spiraling bend in a shofar reminds us that everything is always changing, offering multiple perspectives. How are we describing the problems that confront us in climate change, in climate change, climate crisis is what we should be calling this in, in terms of language. In climate crisis discussion, too much attention is on governmental band-aids and technological fixes, like the extremely problematic carbon intensive uh, renewable, quote unquote, energies. Not enough attention is on how we can educate people to catalyze our own empowerment. In our story, Zazu looks for alternatives for a better world in which in the least expensive expected places, places you might think the opposite would be. We can adapt and continually transform ourselves, but what if we constantly get caught and stuck and caught and stuck like the story of God showing Abraham a ram whose horns get stuck while trying to tear himself free from one thicket and then becoming entangled in another and yet another. This pattern of getting caught and stuck is actually happening right now to rams where I grew up in California. The desert bighorn sheep are endangered there. Solar energy plants are making their situation worse. Because of poor location choices, solar power is being developed in ways that actually harm animals their environment, and local human communities. As we transition away from fossil fuel addicted economies, we must ensure protection of all people's livelihoods and their environments. That includes wildlife in all forms, from the microbial to the largest mammals. Creative alternatives may unintentionally perpetuate the violence of wasteful behavior. They may actually conserve the original problem. Greenwashing through alternative energies is a key example. In 2021, we must be absolutely conscious of the implications of our quote unquote green economy as the new backbone, backbone of environmental racism and green colonialism. We have bought, bought into the idea that anything green is good, but we know that there is no clear cut good and evil. What happens when the very solution causes more problems than the original problem it was supposed to fix? Replacing tar sands or oil drills or coal power plants with megalithic, again, quote unquote, green energy is not the solution. It just masks the original problem, 
confusing freedom with free market and free enterprise. And that's actually a phrase from uh, Hannah Arendt. And it's critical that we begin to um, reinvestigate her philosophies within this context of alternative energies. Industrial sized solar energy development is stripping the land bare, ravaging already extremely vulnerable wildlife. There is not a clear division between clean energy and dirty energy. Clean isn't always clean. De la baran lo improvisó mi padre. Bargains aren't always bargains. Our Sephardic ancestors understood these kinds of contradictions. Even if we find great alternatives to fossil fuels, to, to Jurassic poop, what if renewable energies become big business and just maintain our addiction to consumption and convenience culture? In fact, they already are. Without convenience culture, mass consumer demand, the machine of the free market would have to shift gears. We can't blame the oil companies without simultaneously implicating ourselves, holding our consumption habits equally responsible. So this is a dialogue. How can we insist the government and transnational national corporations be accountable when we refuse to curb our buying and disposal habits? We must move beyond us versus them. This was a riddle for the for Joha, the trickster, to unravel. And the following, the final excerpt, demonstrates how the intertwined past converges with the present and future to form stories that can guide us through climate chaos. And this comes from, a chap from chapter eight, between the scarab and the dung beetle. The scent of orange trees filled the air. My cousins, like thousands of other Jews who live among indigenous North African Berbers, were preparing for Halula. Moroccan Jews from all over the world make pilgrimage each year during Lag Ba Omer into the desert of Khwazen. Thank you. <laughs> to visit cemeteries and celebrate the lives of their beloved rabbis who are called Sadim. We prayed to our revered Sadim for an end to profit driven biocide. We prayed for an end to the monoculture of the mind. Bandana Shiva decries, quote, you really have to have a brutal mind. It's a war against evolution to even think in those profit driven terms. We prayed for zero deforestation agriculture and product chains and ethically shared seeds. Shiva warns us of the implications of terminator technology and terminator seeds. Sterilizing seeds means that farmers are not able to save their seeds, seeds that will destroy themselves through a suicide gene, seeds that are designed to only produce crop in one season. The possibilities of ethically shared seeds are becoming radically diminished as intellectual property rights and utility patents monopolize U.S. agriculture. In resistance, and thank God there is resistance, mashallah, the open source seed initiative, inspired by the conviviality of open source software, has attempted to protect the commons and its ethics of sharing. We prayed for an end to the epidemic of bee colony collapse and for a miracle to convince trawling companies to release the creatures that had been caught and were dying in huge illegal drift gill nets along their migration routes, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. The nets not only torture sea life, slowly drowning dolphins, whales, and sea turtles, along with many other creatures, but they also hurt honest fishermen who catch swordfish locally and legally. Illegally obtained swordfish cheat fishermen and conscientious buyers in other countries. Ignoring the ban encourages illegal fishermen to break the law, disrupt solidarity economics, 
and destroy more life. We silently spoke to Rashbi, asking him to help us stop massive underwater sound cannons that cause sea creatures to go deaf. Marine activists are attempting to stop the US construction of a military airstrip in Japan that would destroy the last habitat for endangered Okinawa dugongs, cousin of the manatee. We prayed that the CVAX would do the work it needs to do. These solar powered ships could potentially clean up the entire Pacific garbage patch in the next 10 years. The CVAX can suck up to 22 million kilograms of plastic a year. However, and this is underlying much of the discussion I would like to have with all of you, this technology does nothing to address the roots of our extraordinarily addictive petroplastic culture and its concomitant tyranny of waste. Additionally, we now know that industrial scale harvested solar energy is extremely carbon in intensive, as I mentioned before, feeding into the illusion of green energy and the fallacious renewables revolution. Please help us solve the roots of the intersecting crises of marginalized peoples, climate refugees, baby macaques, orangutans, monarch butterflies and their sweet gum trees, the whales and other sea mammals. We prayed for what Mama calls our indigenous social ecology. Again, we revisit the concept of adab, lived values for social and personal conduct. This ritual praxis, praxis of ethics can be found in the Zohar, we are suggesting that a collective tikkun olom can be a result of Baltashit. El profe y el rico, todo se mesura por un negro pico. Whether you are rich or poor, you have the same grave. Rabbi David Aron reminds us, quote, Kabbalah is there to help us overcome the misconception of, oh, sorry about that the misconception of disconnect, echoing this consciousness of interconnectedness of expansive united beings. Zazu Dreams confronts false binaries that feed on the illusion that we are separate from one another, separate from our natural world. Such binary codes reinforce entanglements of implicit and explicit forms of corporate coercion and corporeal collusion. Dictating us versus them ideologies, these predetermined prescribed categories of identification generate and sustain environmental and humanitarian injustices. Binary laden conformity, the trap of mere opposition, nullifies deviation from the norm. However, and again, mashallah for the ha, however, e equally potent is our resistance to such hegemonies in the form of collaborative action that ignites personal, collective, cultural, and ecological healing. As it says in the in Pirke Avot, the ethics of the ancestors, the ancient collections of rabbinic writings, do not separate yourself from the community, end quote. When we embrace multiplicity and the sacred possibilities of mutual accountability, we develop the capacity for intra-agency. Agency always emerges in relationship. Through the vast diversity of the Jewish diaspora, we can explore the familiar within the unfamiliar, illuminating a recognition of difference, a spiritual, socio-political connection with the other, increasingly urgent in our reductive, media-saturated, techno-euphoric age. Through, collab through creati creative, collaborative daily choices, we can disentangle the roots of our climate crisis. Once we collectively embody how, as Rabbi Arthur Waskow has uh, assert asserts, Social justice and planetary healing are inextricably intertwined, he tells us. We can ignite biocultural transformation, a resistance to colonialist legacies of systemic economic oppression and extractive industries. 
although I am haunted by the horrors of our insidious and explicit techno-utopic race into a robotic 5G future, I cling tenaciously to the possibility that we can together shift our self-destructive complicity that sustains ravaging anthropogenic environmental racism. A joyful cross-cultural interspecies approach to climate crisis mitigation weaves simultaneous individual community and infrastructural accountability. I'm just gonna say that again to underline it. The simultaneous individual community and infrastructural accountability. Recognizing and nurturing the sacred in everyday objects, we can co-create an action-oriented practice of gratitude and integrity, roots of the Kabbalah. This collective spiritual intelligence, this deep mindfulness is a devotion to nonviolence, a devotion to repurposing objects, to constructing co-beneficial re regenerative infrastructural support systems is an antidote to industrial convenience culture. I maintain my staunch devotion to collective action that could generate the reciprocity, reciprocity of biophilic infrastructures. And I would love to be in conversation with others who also find themselves ignited by such devotion. Cuando una puerta cierra, cien abren. When one door closes, 100 open. And I'd like to thank you all. Um, and thank you to my collaborators, both Zazu and Wild Menagerie, and to once again, Daisy Saragosi for the Ladino Proverbs and Micaela Amato Amato for her beautiful paintings. Um, and we're just finishing here with our contact information with the websites. And these are the um, people who endorsed, the activists, scholars, scientists, artists who endorsed uh, Zazu Dreams. And I'd love to go into conversation now if people have questions, thoughts, reflections, comments, and I will move into the stop share. Okay. And it chats, let's see. Um, oh, thank you for, Elliot, for your Hebrew pronunciation. Do you know how to uh, mm -hmm. pronounce the non-human um, shil Shulach Haken, how, how does one pronounce that properly? Um, <laughs> if, you, if you could I mean, start I, out. I mean, um, my, my pronunciation is so horrendous. Okay. Um, but, yeah. and, and the um, Gilgulim Gu yes. um, was um, for, for, for the, um, the repetition and reincarnation. And, re and yes, well, and, and uh, reanimation. Is reanimation, it, yes. And reanimation. And and the term to dwell, um, I don't have the, the word in front of me. Um, it starts with a V. It's a beautiful word that I, I dare not butcher. <laughs> I, I can speak with you afterwards. Um, I'd love to hear from, from anyone who has some reflections also. I, I just want to congratulate you on such a beautiful presentation. The way you brought you. so many different parts of the culture, I wanna say pan something, and I don't know what pan, it's a panoramic, but it's it's pan cultural, it's pan intellectual, it's pan philosophical. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I tend to think in those big broader ways, and that's why I, I, I commend you for living your, your, your principles like that. I'm trying to, I'm somebody who lived on a 30 foot boat for a while with two gallons of fresh water a day and a composting toilet. And now I'm, I'm 67 years old. My husband just passed away and I'm in a house that's probably too big for me. Uh -huh. I don't quite know, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling like on the personal level. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm up and down over all of this guy. You've got me really emotional about this yeah, because I feel yeah. like, yeah. how do I put my money where my mouth is yes. like you are, but some like, 
but the, the thing, when you mentioned the fact that even something that I think is good, like trying to use solar panels, oh, oh there's always that Achilles heel there. And even that's, I mean, I almost yeah. don't know how to get my head around thinking in the macro yeah. and the micro at the same time. Simultaneously, you know I mean? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Th thank know, you I'm, so much. I'm just spewing. Yeah, I, I so appreciate your vulnerability, Ruth Ellen. Thank you. That's, I think so many of us are in a, a constant place of vacillation. Um, one space of by no means ease or let up, but a place where I can feel a little less compromised in my daily life is by using used objects. Um, on our converted school bus, ev everything, as I mentioned, was repurposed, including the solar panels. And it's actually quite easy to find um, solar panels that are on their way to landfill. There's no way to, um, let's see, I'll, I'll abbreviate that. Um, if people have questions about how to find used batteries, for example, there is a, um, a crisis going on right now in Nevada, um, the Thacker Pass. Um, there's a lithium mine um, proposed that is going through, the Bureau of Land Management has, has pushed it through, but there is still time to resist. Um, and that's based on batteries and people saying, well, we need electric vehicles, so we need to, um, uh, uh, disrupt this particular region in the in the US, which will have serious implications. Um, but if we can go for this, if, if we can really commit to this idea of reused um, materials like batteries and the resources are there, and this is where the community aspect comes in and, and also where technology, where we can help one another. Um, so if people have questions about how to find reused battery solar panels, um, looking also for others who are in your position of, uh, of confusion. If we can think of confusion as a state of grace and, and not as uh, leading to paralysis, which unfortunately, of course, with climate grief and climate anxiety. I hate to sound like the Debbie Downer. It's just like, <laughs> this, this is happening so fast. I, I studied economics, okay? I have a PhD yeah. in economics. I haven't, that's another thing. But, you know, like what you were talking about, there's a classic book by E.F. Schumacher. It's called Small is Beautiful. You know, right. he was a economist. Yeah. So the idea of, of growth. I, I said this in another panel today, until we could change the whole culture of consumerism. I, I'm obsessive Absolutely. compulsive. I, I have a plastic garbage can. I got to give this a little, a plastic garbage can that I like because it fit under my sink, but it still had its own lid and it popped open. Well, then the plastic wore down and all I want to do is replace the top. So I didn't. You know, they don't make that anymore. Right. They don't, and I, I couldn't replace it. I could, you know, and I refuse. I am so stubborn. Well, I put tape, I put epoxy, I file, I mean, and, right. and people are telling me that I'm that I'm nuts, but I mean, it's it's a perfectly good thing, although it's lost one of its, you know, Absolutely. I'm being creative yeah. to try to do it, but a lot, most people aren't going to bother doing well, that. Of course, and then, of course. And then, the, and then on top yeah. of that, there's just too much of that stuff. You know, Wait, uh, one person, uh, I'm one person. Uh, uh, question? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Help me. No, no. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. is, is there a way to uh, to to uh, uh, see this recording or listen to this recording? Yes. After? And how, um, how would we do it? Because we have a committee here. I, I, I'm the founder of uh, Temple B'nai Tikva, which is a reformed congregation up in Calgary, Canada. And, yes. And, uh, uh, we have a committee and uh, I would love them to be able to see the, uh, your presentation. Yes. Uh, how, yeah. For how, those do, how do you do that? Um, why don't you send me your your email address and I can send you a transcript too, because I know that there's a, a lot of information. Okay, but I, I don't have, I don't have your email address. So um, my email is yoga, Y-O-G-A at carajudea.com and that's C-A-R-A j-u-d-e-a and it's in the very top of the, the oh yeah i have that so yoga at parajudea.com yeah and okay, and ruth cool. ellen you also please reach out well, thank yeah. you thank the, you the big, the big bold fest asks you to take the uh, copy of the recording or the link and put it right into um your session so uh all of these sessions will be available all the recordings will be available through the uh, big bold fest
Oh, Thank cool. you. Yes. You just have to do take that recording link and put it in there. Anyway, I just want to say I love this. I, I am studying uh, the Sephardic history. Oh, fantastic. I'm <laughs> just so excited how you use that as a as a structuring uh, metaphor and related it to uh, to today and um, Thank and you. Climate. And I just think that was brilliant what you did. And I thought the pictures were gorgeous. Yes. Well, there are many, many more, and it's a it's a dense book. Uh, so if you are interested in in the book itself, do let me know. I will, and I love the picture about abracadabra because I wrote a poem about abracadabra. Oh, oh. well, there's a whole section about uh, Abra abracadabra in terms of Abraham and crossing borders. So also very much about what you're speaking of with uh, these challenges, these compromises, and how do we straddle, which is, I think, what, what Jews have had to do historically, straddle multiple contradictory places simultaneously, contradictory ideologies and, and, um, you know, and, um, and philosophies. Um, so abracadabra is, there's, there's so much there. I'd love to see your poem, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, um, I can send you my, uh, my email address um, and my website. And because the word is, uh, comes from an Aramaic uh, yes. phrase, perish okay. like the word. And it's exactly okay. yeah and are there others who would like to contribute yes no one else I, else. I, I see Nayama told me yeah, absolutely wonderful it's beautiful and I've been grappling with how to um explain to elders in my community what colonialism why colonialism <laughs> has re, re um reformatted Yes. Um, refocused. And they, sure. this would be a really good way for me to show that um, for them to look at this and to see how through all the years that yeah. it, it's developed this way. And I, I think that you're fabulous and really brave about saying that we have to learn to change too, because we are that. Oh, yes, absolutely. The, the simultaneity is, is really what's at the core. And that, of course, is what is the most challenging and that leads mm -hmm. to to the most sense of impotency i think but and at the same time the most sense of the possibility for for collective action and and hopefully eventually actual change do you and ever bring I, your bus do you ever bring your bus to boston oh you know we went on a, a tour last year but um we're going we we made a, a short bus with my partners um uh, wild menagerie, um, menagerie woodworking with his woodworking inside, and we're going to go on it in a on another tour in a short bus. So probably not the big one because it is big, big relative. But um, let me know your your information, and 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 we can be in contact because we do give bus. tours of the bus. Is that the big bus mm -hmm. now? Yes, I, this is. I think a tour would be wonderful sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's not most time to go. Oh, oh yes, and also, um, if you share your emails with me, I can update you um, on well, for certainly more conversation about this these challenges around renewables, around uh, alternative energies, and how to, how do we discuss intergenerationally, as you mentioned, um, both the extraordinary anguish and the potential. To work together that really is is for me the key both the intergenerational and um and being able to sit in the midst of the contradictions and that's where i think semitic philosophies both both jewish arabic uh, um, th throughout the middle east those philosophies can can help guide us um, are there others? Uh, I, I put my email earlier because i wanted that uh, that uh ladina um oh. dictionary or whatever oh but yes. yeah I, I would like you are one of the first people in a long time who has brought a lot of things together that have been brought together for me for a long when you mentioned patanjali oh, uh you know yeah, i yeah. studied yogananda and all you know i mean it, and that, that's the whole thing i get overwhelmed because i don't explain to people it's this big picture yeah. thing that i think yeah you know, she's that lady was talking about explaining to about colonialism it's like one thread it's like yeah. how, you have to like try to either work backwards from the thread and what is the source. And then from that, you can see with the, the, the breadth of the problems, but we're so far into this historically that this web is so wide, it, it's it's hard not to be overwhelmed, but uh, yes, it's nice, it's nice to meet somebody who's 
put her attention to like putting all this together. I'm, I'm sincere about that. So well, I need allies. <laughs> so thank you. And, and as we all need allies. Um, and that is exactly why this has been so challenging. The, the book, for example, has been so challenging both in Jewish communities and in environmental justice communities, because it is so multi layered. And how do we how do we not close down around that multiplicity? You know, how do we actually embody mm -hmm. and embrace, first of all, and then embody that multiplicity for um, to be, to be uh, you know, I, know. I just want to have hope that people can put it all together soon enough without having the, the idea of survival and, you know, ha having only our evolutionary and biological needs push us at the very last minutes. I mean, that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to avoid, but it takes getting everybody to be live in the conscious moment. And that just, that, that, that really seems overwhelming to me, but you've given well, me some hope today and your child there, beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful family. family. Thank you. Um, and in, in terms of the everybody, I think if, if we can remember that people are coming from such different places and, uh, and I certainly find that challenging in terms of my language being alienating to many people and yeah. again but then that's where we need to find all these in-between spaces as as pockets to then work with other other populations that's why the allegory is nice i just want to say did you think about it? all of a sudden i thought about the whale i mean or is there something about uh daniel in there i don't even know oh. if it's Daniel is know, if, if, if it's like the anti-Daniel or the Daniel, the, the whale's going to be his savior, like he's embracing the whale instead of trying well, to save his destiny. He's, he's in Zazu Dreams. He, he absolutely, he's yeah. another of the characters yeah. also. And then there's, um, let's see, someone in the chat. Not room. Daniel. Who do I, I don't mean oh. Daniel. Daniel is in the lion's den. Who am I thinking? Well, <laughs> Daniel is in Zazu Dreams, but also um, J Jonas, you mean. Jonah, Jonah, yeah. that's who Jonah. I meant. He's, yeah. he's in there too. <laughs> <laughs> there are many of them are Jonah's the whale, Daniel's the lion's den. Yeah, I mixed yeah. it up. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm probably I'm monopolizing this. No, I'm no, sorry. no one else is coming in, but I'm, I'm really impressed. I have to say that. Thank you. I, I mean, I found out about this whole festival at the last minute three days ago, and I've been. I've been oh, it was meant to be. Three, I mean, I've been, I've been uh, what do they call it? You know, uh, binging on it. <laughs> yeah. it's, the, it's the big, bold binge. Uh, and someone has suggested if you're interested in the big picture, check out my novel, The Swallow and the Nightingale, about a 4,000 year old secret brought through time through the birds. Beautiful. That's Thea mm. Eberall. Thank you, Thea, for sharing that. I will do that. It has the Sephardic, Sephardic roots in it and also goes back 4,000 years to the goddess civilization, and it has a climate change. Um, story in it also i mean it's beautiful really cool. oh, thank you for for sharing that with all of us and um i'm i'm always excited to hear how people cross time when we're talking about contemporary issues so that we can be in multiple places simultaneously to really use history um as a as a as a as a motivational as an as an element of motivation um rather than something that is separate so I'm, I'm excited to see your work and let's see. I don't, I want only one list. I don't remember if it was in your bio or not. What is your PhD in? Uh, critical philosophy. Oh, uh, but it's, it's very much um, about how can we use the vulnerability of our ethnicity, our sexuality, um, our political commitments, how can we use those vulnerabilities, um, including the vulnerability you mentioned of, of, of being in multiple places at once um, as a strategy for social justice. Um, so that's what th that work was Ooh. about. Um, I, <laughs> I always said if, if, if I had more guts, I would have majored in philosophy, but I did economics because I, well, I still think that's the too. core of, of yeah. dealing Cara, with all yes. of this stuff. Um, this is Margie. I put down a group in Cleveland, Ohio okay. that speak, it's speaks your same language. Okay. And, if, <laughs> I and, and what I'm trying to say is that there yeah. are other people also in the process of creating 
and pulling all these together, I wrote down Lake Erie Institute and the person you want to uh, be oh, in touch Charles. with. Yes. It, do you know them? I, I Yeah, I know Charles. He actually is from the same community where my mother teaches um, at Penn State well, University, his family. Um, so I, I know him actually. From these are place. two different <laughs> things, though. Yes. I don't Charles. know. Too, but I know Charles and thank you for highlighting that. Yeah, so at the Lake Erie Institute, you want to talk with Nareet Brenner. Nareet Brenner, okay, fantastic. Yeah, she's the director okay. and uh, the two of you would be off to the races when you started <laughs> talking. It's just really nice to have other people finding the language, Absolutely. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is, this is um, a, obviously a challenging process. Also for, for choosing a place to, to live and to raise our child. Um, so if people have suggestions <laughs> for, for other parents in particular who are committed to these, to these life choices. Um, but thank you, Margie. I will, I will contact Marit. Uh, only because you said that it was on CBS Sunday morning. They were talking about the, the best place to live with climate change away from hurricanes and whatever and, yeah. and everything you need. And it was Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> Which, uh, beautiful. I, I'm not surprised it was a college town. I said the yeah. lakes, the water, except for the cold. And, and the mayor said, you know, it's the climate isn't wrong. It's just your clothes are wrong. You know, if you have the right clothes, you can, well, you can uh, be that's one way of perceiving it. Diana, what do you think of <laughs> Yeah, I didn't catch where you're located. Where are you now? Oh, um, we're in Colorado now. We were living on an eco village in North Carolina, um, but we were again told that we were too radical, um, and so we, we ended up we're back in the Rockies in, in Colorado, um, and yeah, that story goes on. But I can send you some of the details of of this um, migration. Our, our odyssey in the in the love bus if you like um, love bus family on um, Facebook has has some of that information nice. and there's been a lot of articles written about us too and Thea's book is fabulous it's, it's an amazing read um, it opens well, up many things so I read it a year or two ago and it's still in my heart the the um, it's really good wonderful. We've, Oh, oh, so good. I'm, I'm glad you're here together, oh, yeah. too. Thank you, Nayana. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. It's nice to meet all of you like-minded people. Got to start somewhere. <laughs> and Micaela, did you want to say something? No, OK. OK, she's all right. Oh, that's the artist. Oh, my God, the paintings are gorgeous. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, and that's my oh thumbs up. Thumbs oh, up to her. Beautiful. And um, we, I we loved hearing everything that you had to say, all of you wonderful people. Thank you. It's just magical, the pictures. Thank you so much. And we okay. exhibit, we exhibit. Here's an idea. It's time to animate that, and it's time to animate that. Oh, and make thank it you for easy. reminding me. Two things. Um, I have been in the process of adapting Zazu Dreams to both a screen, you can come in, a screen production and a stage production. Um, and we were working with an animator. Um, that didn't uh, unfold in the end. Get the kinks out. Thoughts about uh, adapting it, th this to um, stage and screen or screen. Um, I've been. Bravo to our little narrator there. <laughs> really enjoyed you. Um, please do let me know because I, I am very interested in collaborating um, and seeing this work speak in different languages. Um, for different kinds of audiences. So um, your your mention of animation is, is <laughs> perfect. I don't know anybody myself, but it's, it looks like it would lend itself to that very, very yeah. well. I have a quick question for Ruth yeah. Allen. What city, Ruth Allen, what city are you in? I am right now in a little town called Fernandina Beach on Amelia Island. It's the northernmost barrier island in Florida. Um, oh. It's uh, just north of Jacksonville. Yeah. But it's, it's a challenge because it's like the reddest part of the reddest state and it's very frustrating for people. Yeah, and the, the, I don't know who's hearing this. The amazing thing is a lot of the, uh, this has become a, a, 
a nexus for retirees who don't want to get away from the cold, but don't want to go all the way to South Florida. They like the change of seasons. So we're, now we're having the mix of the, the, the natives kind of still to some degree that I never realized had that the Confederate mentality, you know, when you look at the history, like Jacksonville was one of the last uh, places to desegregate schools, things like that. And there are constantly those things going on. But now we have this influx of people who want to make change, except we're stuck with this gerrymandered mess with the Republicans controlling everything. And it's, it's you know, because of the money in the politics, you can't really even, they're, they're, they're closer to getting attempts to getting uh, somebody, uh, you know, a different thought at this point, mostly it's going to be Democrats, but it's a place to start. And even then, maybe you're lucky if they get 25%, you know, because. I understand. Thank you. It's, it's, you anyway, touch, you keep touch with where, me. where are you, Nayana? I'm in the Boston area. And I have to, I belong to a group called Jewish Climate Action Network. Oh, beautiful. I've heard of that. It also, yes. and a lot of people belong to it and it's Jewish, Je Jewish Climate. I've heard of that. Now I can't think of the, the, the website. The acronym, um, uh, you can, I can Google that and I'm sure it'll, it'll get to that. Just put it in the, oh, uh, I'm the secretary of JCAN and I just put it in the uh, chat. Wonderful. And, and a lot of people don't, we've been around for five or six years, but if you want to email us, we come, we come to our meetings, they're on Zoom now, but there's a lot of progressive people who are we're all trying out different models and different ideals. And Ruth Ellen, you are in the hardest place to be, I understand. <laughs> I have other relatives. Yeah, Except now my blood is thinned. I don't think I could go back to living in cold weather. Right. <laughs> anyway. So, well, It'll work out. Yeah. That's my, my greatest, my final motto is things will work out one way or the other. I mean, there's no well, way anybody can ignore that you're it. here is, is that you heard about it three days ago is, I think it's easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bashir, yes. Good shop yeah. to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. It's really Thank been you. a pleasure to meet all of you. Yes, I'm late. I hope I, I have so many things. I'm sitting in one place, not getting enough exercise, being just overwhelmed with all this wonderful people and information. I have to start synthesizing out, but you're near the top of the list, Kara. I'm telling oh, you, you're, well, you're really you. something And all of you. Thank you. Well, I would suggest in your, in your synthesis process, um, if you can go upside down in some capacity, put your legs up <laughs> okay. and go yoga. And, um, and that really does help our-, our I just read a thing about one of the, you know, lie on the end of the bed and, 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 I, and lay over up on your back and arch over and let your, the blood rush to your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really, uh, you know, our bodies, I think um, that, that really is so key, how we can incorporate our, our corporeality, you know, our viscerality into this process of, trying to negotiate these extraordinary challenges mm -hmm. and, and potential devastations. But if we can go back to our bodies as, as guides. So it's, again, it's the simultaneity of, of yeah, yes, yes, micro yes. and in, in our, our consciousness, our body. Navigating, navigating the new duality is like my husband tried to make, he's the one who became my spiritual teacher because of his spiritual path. He said, an Indian guru led him back to Christianity or the same guru led me back to Judaism. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. like I said, you know, Joseph Campbell quoted the, the poets who, I, on his power of myth, there was, I think, a, a, an Arabian poet who said, everyone is so, so obsessed with fighting over the, the, the um, prose that they don't realize they're all speaking the same poem. And I thought that was one of the greatest, oh, wow. because if something is truth and it's where we have to be, there has to be that core, the essence yeah. that, yeah. you know, everybody could agree on if they just get all that other muck out of the way, yeah. you know? Ellen, yeah. Ellen, excuse me, do you, yes. knit, do you knit a crochet? Ruth Ellen, do you knit yes. a crochet? Because I found something really helpful this weekend to unravel, to unwind. Take yeah, I, I, I used to crochet. Yeah. Like okay. take some knitting that you don't care about or an old scarf or something and find the end and just keep unraveling it. It was very <laughs> helpful to kind of undo because we have to undo the stories that we're in. We have to undo the confusion that we're in. Before it's unlearn and unlearning. We have to unlearn. Yeah, 
She's got it. Okay. Okay. That's a cool exercise. I like. Now, what, what Amato has to do is then she just has to let that lie there and and paint it, you know, however it however it falls and see what we get. <laughs> the, the, the simultaneity. Oh, yeah. Yes. We have, we're, we're, we're covered by the beautiful things our, my mother has, has crocheted us. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so yeah, much. Um, and you said something also, Nayana and, and Ruth Ellen, as you're speaking. Um, about the, the interwoven. Oh, well, just again, looking cross culturally, that there's so many examples of what the tapestry holds and what that means in terms of our interconnectedness and our, our, the possibility for mutual accountability. That if we can, if, if we can, um, if we can take these, these symbols and these stories, these parables, and, and see how they apply to how we breathe, you know, <laughs> not just how we raise our children and, and how we um, wake up in the morning, but, but on, a, on a cellular level. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, th there, there's something about that that can invigorate um, our collective memory, our ancestral memory as, as, as Jews, as peoples. Um, I think if more people could do that, that could breed empathy too, because exactly. as the more you feel yeah. part of the whole. And, right. yeah. yeah, yes, yes, yes. And I just want to invite you, lastly, all of you um, in March with the Academy um, of the American Academy of Religion, I'll be giving six different presentations um, in the J Jewish uh, unit, yeah. Islamic unit. Your, your, your website that you have there, you'll, you're going to have that you'll probably post that kind of stuff, right? I should. Uh, oh, oh, okay. I, I should. Just, um, I, I may not because I'm, I'm also a technophobe. So oh. I, I need to figure all that out. But all right, then say um, the American, what, what is it? Where are you um, speaking? It's the American from? Academy for Religion. Uh, oh. And if with your email, I'll send you some information. But there's okay. going to be an, an educational unit, an ethics unit, um, Islamic, Jewish, um, uh, pagan, there's uh, several of them that I'll be participating in. And, um, and as I said, I'm always eager for collaboration. So thank you. I appreciate thank everyone's you. input and presence here. And enjoy the rest of Big, big Bold Jewish. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to the next one, Rao, about another one about Adam and the earth. So we'll see how Beautiful. that goes. Beautiful. Enjoy, everyone. <laughs> Hope to see all of you some oh, other way, some other Diana, time. Diana, did you want to share anything? I just, the person who's leading that, Ruth Ellen, the person who's leading yeah. about Adam, he's wonderful. He's, I, he's from Detroit, but he does a lot of workshops and you can join. I had a, like eight people. We met with him for a couple of months. Oh, just, beautiful. Yeah. So it was Fantastic. really nice. Just well, may, maybe I'll be able to get a few Zoom things. Like th there are a lot of people locally here that I wish I had told them about this before. That, you know, founding the Three Conservancy, that's what I'm saying. A lot of these people ended up, I met them through the Jewish community of all these, these snowbirds that became permanent residents. And oh, the, okay. I'd say a good, you know, 70% of the big activists are, are from a Jewish background. Take that yes. for what it means, but we're the seekers and the, the well, studiers, I, I guess. Prosecution. I, I'm, certainly my experience with anti-Semitism growing up in, in partially in small towns in Texas, that mm. those extraordinary um, violations to, to my being as a, as a Jewish young girl um, absolutely informed my life commitment to living ecologically. So I think that there's, and, and to anti-racist work uh, and, and coalition building. And I, so I, again, if we can take our histories and the horror and transform it, that that to me is resiliency, not preparing for Armageddon by buying plastic totes, you know, which is what a lot of um, resiliency commissions in different cities are doing. I mean, that, that you know, as a, obviously a very yeah. minor, but it's, it's that mentality that we can consume our way out of the nightmare that we've created rather than uh, right. yeah. Yeah. be in a place of, uh, extraordinary self-inquiry and and uh, accountability so um, uh, fyi I, I did a, a workshop yesterday in the uh, fest 
uh, about um, from writing from the deep voice. Mm. And, oh. Um, it's a way to um, tell stories, but from a very emotional, deep place. Uh, the recording is, uh, I did post the recording so you can watch it. And also, Jay can I'm going to be running an ongoing uh, writing uh, uh, webinar so that people can practice because it's really important to um, to convince other people or to wake up other people through storytelling, not just through science. So I offered that yesterday, and I will be offering that um, ongoing through Jay can nice. Wonderful. Thank you, Thea. Yeah, and that that again, it in in our culture that devalues storytelling and positions it as as inferior or, or folk. Um, uh, yeah, it, this is absolutely critical. And, and I write a lot about that, how people, uh, our, the illusion that science, that there's a monolithic science and that science or those um, voices of authority override um, when so, much, so many oral traditions have their own science, like Ibn Sina, you know, the Persian polymath, um, who's all over Zazu dreams. Um, you know, how do we, how do we take stories seriously, and and the act of storytelling as a radical political project? So I'm so glad you're you're underlining. Well, that. It's also really important to um, tell stories that are gripping, and um, this was a uh, the deep voice. Uh, teachings are by a, a LA poet, uh, Jack Grapes. I studied with him for three years and um, he wrote a book called uh, Method, uh, Method Writing. And uh, so I explain all these and I have a simple way to teach it to people. And, um, and it's like when E.F. Hutton speaks, everyone listens. And then when a writer is in the deep voice, yeah. you have to listen to what this person is saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a specific technique. It's great, and I'd love to um, um, help people uh, do that if they're interested in learning it. And and your teacher Jack Graves, you said his name. Grapes, like the grapes. grapes. Like okay, the Jack Graves. Wonderful, beautiful. Okay, I'm writing all that down. Thanks, Thea. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Um, any other? By the way, <laughs> last thoughts. All right. Thank you. Well, enjoy. So Thank much. you. Hello. <laughs> Bye, Zazu. Good Shabbos, everybody. Good Shabbos. Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom. And um, again, with Ladino. <laughs> 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 All right. Enjoy. Shabbat Shalom. I'm send you some um, information. I've been studying.